I dreamt of the dragon. I have awoken him. Can't you see all around you the dragon's breath? Have you seen me die, Spike? <laughs> Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. This is the second part of episode 53, which is all about King Arthur Pendragon RPG, and it includes all the bits that didn't quite fit into the first part. It's not a supplement, it's more like a re-release of a great campaign that goes back further than your parents, further than your grandparents. In fact, it starts when Uther is a microorganism, replicating and about to form a ribozyme. It's really good to have David Larkins back for this part, as many people enjoyed his open box last time. This time he faces the game's master screen and we roll apparently at random on a table to discover elements of his gaming career, including Berlin, Wicked City for Call of Cthulhu. We've said a number of times that gaming doesn't exist in a vacuum. Our imaginations have been shaped and influenced along the way. This time I'm joined by Drish Blythe our resident rules lawyer, as we look back at old copies of Starburst magazine and talk about the film Excalibur, John Borman's 1981 epic, a visual feast based on Mallory's Le Mort de Arthur, and we discuss how it can continue to influence our games. It's something about the trees, I think, the magical representation of the countryside of our imaginations. Another influence on our imaginations that we covered in episode 27 is, of course, Robin of Sherwood. Sam Vale has nominated it to be added to Appendix G, our list of collectible series of books, TV, films and comics that have inspired the Grog Squad. He focuses on the role of the villains in the series. He has some experience in hacking Pendragon, so he gives some examples as he sees the potential of this system to be generic. Blythe and I grab our coats to have a bit of closing time chatter before I come back again with a brief update on what's coming next. Until then, ramblers, let's get rambling. Games Master Screen. Welcome to the uh, Games Master screen. I've got David Larkins with me. Hello, David. Welcome back. Hello, hello. I'm glad to be back. Okay, I'm going to construct this Games Master screen in between us to hide my secret table, which I'm going to roll upon. I've got a D20, of course. You should roll one and we should oppose it, shouldn't we? But we won't go that far. (laughs) Right. Okay, straight away, I've got a critical hit here. We've got Berlin, the Wicked City. So this is the uh, supplement and scenarios that that you created for Call of Cthulhu. So how did that come about? Why Berlin at that time? It's it's a really interesting tale, actually. Um, uh, It it actually had its genesis when I was very young and just getting into gaming. GURPS was my second RPG. And after I bought the GURPS uh, rulebook, I picked up GURPS Horror which was a great book, still is. Is that the one that Ken Height wrote? Ken Height yeah. did the third and fourth editions of Grips right, Horror. Okay. Um, second edition Grips Horror was Scott Herring and um, yeah, a couple others. And they they sort of mirrored the format that Call of Cthulhu was using at the time, which was sort of presenting three different time periods, Gaslight, Roaring Twenties, and Modern. And uh, and so in the, in the 20s section, they talked about, like, well, here's some places you can set your campaign and there's just a little sidebar you know Weimar Germany and you know it said something like you know this is an underutilized setting for horror 12 year old me read that and went 
Hmm. noted, you know, <laughs> and then <laughs> 25 years later or whatever, you know, like, um, but, you know, I, I've always been interested in German history, German culture, for whatever reason, just kind of was something that caught my interest when I was young. It was just a, a, a focus study for me informally. And uh, so originally it was, it was just going to be a home campaign. I was just going to run a Call of Cthulhu campaign set in Berlin. I started doing some research and as I did more research, you know, I'm like, oh, there's a lot here. I could. And then I, I actually pitched it as a monograph when back when Chaos Team was doing the Call of Cthulhu monograph program. And for whatever reason, uh, never heard back actually about that, which, you know, ended up being a good thing. You know, again, like when I decided like, hey, I'm going to make a stab at, at full-time uh, writing in the gaming uh, sphere, you know, that was obviously at the top of my list. And so simultaneous to connecting with with Greg Stafford and working on Pendragon stuff, you know, I was kind of getting to know, I, I just happened to be at, at the Gen Con. The first Gen Con I went to was 2015. And um, that happened to be the one where the, the new, the new Chaosium crew mm-hmm. came in, right? The moon design crew. And, um, and so Greg was like, I think you're going to want to be at the you know, what's happening at Chaosium panel tonight, you know, I was like, okay, you know, so I show up and they do their big announcement. I'm listening to everything they're saying. I'm like, oh, this sounds amazing. You know, cause they're like, you know, we, we want to do full color. We want to, you know, we want to really raise the bar. We want to advance our games, you know, to new levels. I'm like, yes, yes, all of that. And so, uh, and, and Jeff Richard in particular said, you know, Hey, we're looking for new talent. So if anyone wants to write for us, so two seconds after they wrapped up, I was like vaulting over the chairs between <laughs> me and the front of the room and just ran up to Jeff and I said, I want to write a book about Berlin for Call of Cthulhu. And I didn't know he was living in Berlin at the time. He's married to a German woman, you know, and he's just like, yes. <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> yeah. And w- once again, it's, uh, as we were saying uh, last time, you know, you've got uh, two uh, KSCM writers living in Berlin, but you wrote the uh, source book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we actually, we actually put the word out, you know, um, I, my intention was not to write the whole book. Uh, or you know 90% of the book uh you know we we put the word out to some german designers and you know and everyone was just busy you know and so it was just like well i guess i'll take a stab at it so yeah i, I wrote the bulk of the book and then mike and lynn came in and, and added some some excellent uh final touches that i think really you know helped to take it up to the next level both in terms of editing and like some some new content that they put in there um but you know never again I'm never writing uh, 80,000 words worth of scenarios for a single book if I can help it, you know? Like, <laughs> it's uh, tough, it was, isn't it? It was, it's tough. It's a, it's yeah, a it, was, tough it was just pure naivete that led me to do that. So, you know. Hey. Yeah, yeah. And, and what is it about um, uh, the Weimar period, Germany? It's such, such a rich uh, vein of um, Gothic noir because uh, there's kind of a run in popular culture, isn't there, of uh, the appeal of that period? Yeah, there sure is. And, you know, that was actually a really interesting bit of timing is that um, I think I had just submitted the manuscript when Babylon Berlin came out on, on British and American TV or streaming services, at least. And, um, you know, <laughs> I saw that. I was like, oh, my God. You know, so I like wrote to Mike. And I'm like, you have to put this in the recommended viewing part of the book, you know. But like I was working on the book without uh, completely ignorant of that show and or the novels at the time it was definitely a zeitgeist uh you know to use a german phrase um you know to the whole thing and i i think it is you know you touched on it it's gothic it's uh noir um it's somewhat post-apocalyptic right because it's right after this this horrendous war which you know germany was on the losing end of particularly the the you know if you're setting your game in the earlier years when the high hyperinflation is is taking off and you know there's political violence and all this other stuff yeah i mean obviously there's sort of a prurient uh side to it because this was you know this den of sin you know like where anything goes right you know but you can you can turn that and i did in some of the scenarios you know you turn that into material for like horror gaming you know and another thing i've heard from a lot of folks is that there's also just a sense of doom because everybody knows where it's going to go. It's a great, it's a great uh, book. So well done with that. Thanks. Let's let's roll, let's roll on uh, the table again. Okay. That's uh that's a, a 10. And um, yeah, I wanted to mention this because I think this is how I first uh, knew of you when you, you contacted me very early on, actually, when I started the <laughs> podcast and uh, the esoteric order of uh, role plays, your actual play uh, sequence. So uh, tell people about that if they don't know about it, because uh, 
it's probably one of the first actual plays that I listened to. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I am a longtime listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, well, that you know, that came about, you know, because I was writing writing up session summaries, session reports on my blog. And so I was, you know, a little used to sort of publicly sharing the details of the games I was playing. I was also sort of getting plugged into audio, uh, actual play podcasts, um, audio only podcasts. And um, it was just one of those things where it's like, I'm listening to other, other groups play and I'm thinking like, well, gosh, you know, I think my group's uh, as good as these folks, you know, maybe I'll put out some stuff. A couple of my players sort of pushed me into it also. <laughs> They're just like, you know, <laughs> yeah, we're awesome. You know, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was just, it was just kind of a, let's see what happens, put the, phone in the middle of the table and hit record kind of thing. And then, you know, just, you know, oh my God, we had one download. Somebody listened to us, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it just sort of progressed from there, you know, get decent mics or more decent mics at least, you know, I'm not an audio visual guy. So like it was very much again, sort of teaching myself how to do this stuff. And it's, I did my best and um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're still going um, the, the pandemic kind of, because okay, so the the original objective with with the uh, EOR is that I wanted it to be. I know there's a lot of like really highly produced actual plays, and those are very entertaining. They're heavily edited. They have like sound effects added in, all this other kind of stuff. I wanted ours to just be like literally. This is what it's like to sit at a gaming table, you know. And uh, if you've never played, this is what it's like. Uh, you know, if you're if you're kind of in a in a deep freeze part of your life, which I've definitely heard from listeners who are, you know, hey, this is how you can get your gaming fix. If you're curious about how a game actually works at the table, like some of our highest downloads are like, you know, our, our one-offs that we play some, you know, obscure like Ryotama or something, right? You know, and everyone's like, well, there's no Ryotama actual place ever this one. I'll listen to these guys, you know, because people just want to kind of get an idea of how the game plays, you know? And so um, minimal editing, which does make for long episodes, but, you know, whatever, you know, listen to yeah. it while you're doing the dishes or whatever. That's sort of the philosophy. But so for about seven years, it was our, it was like my home group. We would gather at the table face to face. And then obviously the pandemic happens. Can't do that anymore. And so the last couple of years, you know, we, we pivoted to um, online games, which actually was great because it allowed me to bring in some friends from other parts of the country that, you know, I wanted to game with and hadn't been. So, you know, we sort of you know, evolved through that. And then I don't, you know, in the future, we'll probably return to the table, but you know, we've, we've been going at this for almost 10 years now. You know, we have a big back catalog. I, I have a, a low tolerance for actual plays, but I enjoy listening to yours. So that's a, that's a recommendation. Um, yeah, Cause as you said, I, I like that uh, natural uh, gameplay. And I think, yeah. uh, it's more rewarding, I think, uh, than voice actors and uh, all that kind of thing. I think you get more more from the experience, and you've got quite a back catalog. If if, if you were directing people to uh, which ones to listen to, have you any that you would recommend? You know, that's an excellent question. I'm I'm going to be uh, doing an overhaul of our website this year, um, and and kind of making a little bit more navigator friendly, you know, or navigation friendly for for new folks. Um, and I think that's definitely something I'll, I'll have to prioritize is like make a little like tab you can go to and just say, um, interested in, in, in our stuff. Here's a couple, you know, examples of what you can maybe expect, you know, come to expect. There's a particular, we, we did the whole Great Pendragon campaign that's all available. And there's a particular episode, the exact year escapes me. <laughs> it's basically, it was a, a session where only a couple of the players could show up that week. And so I just ran this, um, this uh, homebrew scenario I downloaded off the internet years and years ago about going to this uh, land of, of talking frogs, basically who all think they're knights, you know? So it's just like a fairy tale kind of thing. And, um, and one of the, one of the player knights actually ended up marrying the frog princess and staying there. <laughs> so <laughs> the adventure of Sir Long Hop or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll seek it out and I'll put it in the show notes so that people can. Brilliant. Find it. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. You. Okay. I'm rolling again. And uh, this time I've got uh, 14 and uh, what's this? It's uh, Patrick Swayze in uh, baby oil doing Tai Chi. On That's the right. banks of a river. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, 
uh, about a year ago, I was watching uh, Roadhouse, my annual watch of Roadhouse, and I tweeted about mm-hmm. it. And you said, I've written a game, an, an action <laughs> movie game for the 80s. Yeah. Uh, so so, so tell, tell us about that, uh, Action International. Action International. So, um, yeah, hopefully... It'll see the light of day this year. Um, it's kind of been waiting on a on a green light for a Kickstarter, um, but it's it's ready to go. It's going to be published through Gallant Knight Games. My uh, colleague Alan Barr, who, by the way, also a huge Pendragon fan, and I think is probably has to hold the Guinness record for running the most uh, full runs of the Great Pendragon campaign, possibly outside of Greg Stafford. Um, I think he he's definitely up in the double digits. I mean, it's twenty wow. something at this point. It's really really impressive because he runs multiple groups simultaneously, you know? So, um, but anyway, so Alan, Alan and I were just kind of throwing ideas around and, and a old friend of mine, Alex Drusts, who um, was like the first guy that I started gaming with actually way back in the day. Uh, you know, we, we both grew up on eighties action cinema and, you know, eighties martial arts films and stuff like that. And so just kind of out of those, out of those chats, you know, Alex and I, we're like, hey, why don't we just write a sort of fun, uh, fast play, you know, action movie homage kind of game, you know? And uh, so Action International is is the is the result of that. Yeah, and uh, it it really has the sense of you know the films with um, Dolph Lundgren in and uh, <laughs> <laughs> those, those great films from from the eighties. Let's face it, Roadhouse is one of the best films of the 80s. Surely. Oh, it? yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Hands down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's a great example of, of what we were trying to achieve in the game. Speaking of like, you know, like in terms of, um, uh, you know, writing a game's mechanics to fit a genre, right? You know, what we really wanted to capture was the fact that in those movies, everybody seemed to know a martial art, you know, and, <laughs> and, and people would just have a throwing star tucked in their boot or whatever, or like, you know, they'd have a katana in the trunk of their car, you know? So we wanted to really, so everybody, regardless of whatever genre you're emulating, everybody knows martial arts. So you, you, you know, one, one of the games we loved back in the day was uh, Ninjas and Super Spies by Palladium Books. And so, you know, we, we used to just make characters for that game. It had 41 martial arts styles in it. So we would just sit around and make different, you know, oh, my guy's a ninja, my guy's a, you know, uh, sumo wrestler, you know, whatever. Um, so we wanted to definitely capture that feel, you know, where you're part of a big part of the game is actually picking out, you know, your martial arts style and then kind of, uh, you know, frankly, min maxing the, uh, <laughs> the, the moves, right. You know, to get the, the optimal combos and then, yeah, you can run it. It's flexible enough. Uh, sort of my demo game actually is, is a, um, an homage to glow the Netflix series and also the actual gorgeous ladies of wrestling, where all the pre-gens are, are lady wrestlers in a 80s wrestling promotion. And they're, you know, trying to take down the local baddie who's, you know, uh, dumping toxic waste in their neighborhood. So if that doesn't get you thousands of pre-orders, I do not know what will. <laughs> will <laughs> I'll look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> okay, let's uh, roll again. Oh, and I've rolled a 20. And I, this um, is the final roll. And um, I want to mm. uh, get your help here because I'm okay. about to write my first RuneQuest campaign for 35 years. And uh, I've, I've run quite a few of the uh, pre done ones. I've run uh, Borderlands, but I, I thought it was time to dust off RuneQuest Glorantha and uh, come up with a game set in Prax. So, what are your oh. tips for a uh, uh, a long running campaign in Prax. Oh boy. Oh wow. Okay. So, you know, for myself, uh, uh I count myself as 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 a as more of a fan of RuneQuest than like a master of RuneQuest. Right? I've I've written some material for RuneQuest that will be coming out at some point. But you know, definitely it's been um, you know, the newest Chaosium game for me, you know, uh over the last five years. Um, so I'm gonna apply some of my Pendragon knowledge to this, uh, you know, since you want to run a long running game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, of course, obviously the current version of RuneQuest um, does emulate Pendragon a little bit in the sense that like the suggested pace is one scenario per season, right. Rather than one per year, like you get in Pendragon, but it still does, you know, you don't get that, that um, effect you get in like D and D a lot where it's like, 
you're going to go through uh, 10 levels with your character in like two weeks of game time, right? Because it's just nonstop action. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you can definitely plan things out in that way. Um, are you thinking of like maybe starting a little earlier and then working up towards the current year? Or are you going to start in the current year and move forward well, from there? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking taking it uh, back from the current year because my idea is yeah. to take several groups so um, for people to have cool. a mig- migration path. So play one of the tribes of Prax and it's, the actual party is going to be um, trail finders who are going ahead of the clan to clear the way for the next season for the settled the clan to come and settle and um, so they, they they're kind of doing a clearance job and um, so uh the idea is then hand over to another group after 10 sessions so to take it year on year uh, oh so, great yeah that's a really great yeah that's awesome so since you're taking it back you're, you're going to have some idea of the timeline you know you you can consult the older materials and you know sort of fill in the gaps so that would be like the the place you'd want to start is just kind of assembling a um you know sort of a a little chronology kind of like the great pendragon campaign right you know where you're you're just going year by year here's what happens every year in the canon you know here's what these characters and pracs are up to here's what argrath is up to you know and and so forth and then um uh you know work on your own stuff you know over here you're going to have two streams basically paralleling each other and what you'll find is that the uh, the players are going to bounce back and forth between those streams, right? And and then what you're going to do there is uh, not be beholden to the canon, you know. Mm-hmm. So if uh, you know if if they go off the rails with Argraph, you know, in some way <laughs> that's really unexpected to you, like swearing loyalty or becoming blood enemies or whatever, um, you know, and that's going to affect Argraph's path. Let it affect it, you know, like just you know, be willing to to roll with the punches and even look for opportunities where you can insert player characters into the canon chronology, you know, instead of this NPC does this, maybe it's this player character does this instead. And that's going to get them invested in that, in that what's going on on a macro scale, right? You know, because what you want is for a long running campaign, what you want is the players to really feel like they have stakes and they really want to know how this is all going to turn out rather than kind of being like, you know, mercenaries or whatever. Like, I don't really care what happened. Yeah, absolutely. And th- that's, that's re- really good. And I think uh, Pendragon and playing Pendragon has definitely influenced my um, thoughts on uh, RuneQuest and, uh, and, and that idea of um, setting up moral crisis or decisions that, uh, people have to face and the characters have to face and the uh, passions and runes challenge. So um, I think Pendragon has definitely fed into that. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing I'd say about that is, um, you know, there's a certain phonetic similarity between Arthur and Argrath. That's not mm. entirely coincidental. So, you know, ah, don't, yes. Don't be afraid to maybe, you know, look for some mirror image parallels in those stories, you know. Well, that that is a bombshell uh, to, <laughs> that we can leave uh, the Games Master screen. That, that's a great piece of advice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave. It's been great speaking to you over these uh, past uh, two podcasts. So thank you very much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Starburst Memories! Welcome to Starburst Memories. Starburst was a magazine that we studied as intently as White Dwarf. It's still going. The magazine of cinema and television fantasy. I've got Blythe with me. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. I think we found out about Excalibur via Starburst. Yeah, uh, we did, and uh, I think great excitement. Starburst covered it, and did the Clapperboard cover it? Was it Clapperboard? Or it was. Chris Kelly on Clapperboard, wasn't it? Like a kid's thing. I remember talking about the plastic armour, lots of horses galloping around, and John Bowman saying they filmed it in Ireland because the Industrial Revolution never hit Ireland, so you've got all this rural stuff going on. Very much so, very much so. And I, I did used to uh, study uh, Starburst, and um, they actually did a poster magazine, and we'll just go through these a little bit because I think it gives you a sense of um, the build-up and how they were trying to pitch it. And the coverage of Excalibur started very early for Starburst. I've got this old one. I don't think I had this one uh, back at the time. This is uh, from 
November 1978, and it's got Lou Ringo on the cover. Look at this. <laughs> Incredible Hulk. Just as it's being launched over here in the UK, uh, the Incredible Hulk, and a big feature article about how Lou Ringo, how long it takes him to put his makeup on. <laughs> but in this, uh, it's uh, an article about John Boardman's Merlin. And that's what it was originally called. The original film pitch was uh, Merlin. And he said that he's been working on that project for 15 years. I think at one point he was developing uh, a version of Lord of the Rings. He talks about that, doesn't it? Yeah, he's writing Lord of the Rings and it gets abandoned. It's in- interesting, isn't it, that? Yeah, in, in this article, there are his concept drawings. And uh, early on, you've got the uh, you know that very striking image of the knights who are searching for the Holy Grail, hanging from the tree, Morgan Le Fay's uh, tree. The other the other thing that is included in this article is the uh, scenario pitch. How he was going to the different uh, stories that he was going to focus on, and it's clear that Merlin was meant to originally be. The key figure in this, this was going to be the audience's way into the story. And Percival, Arthur was going to be almost an NPC in his own story. Um, and this was going to be about uh, Merlin's take on what was happening and Percival's way in. And you can almost see remnants of that in the I film. To, yeah, I, I think you can, yeah, because they're in a way, they're the most interesting characters in the film, arguably, aren't they? Merlin. And Percival, when Percival appears, he's more relatable than a lot of the other knights. This young lad who wants to be a knight, you know, and he meets Lancelot and gets knighted by Arthur on the spot because none of the other knights have got the nerve to take on to take on Liam Neeson. I think Liam Neeson, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I Jim. They probably watched Taken, haven't they? And thought, I don't tackle him. He's got very specific <laughs> skills in a lance. But you're right, Percival is. Yeah, he's he's more relatable, isn't he? In a, in a way, it's a shame he's not in it from the beginning almost. He only yeah. comes in about halfway through, doesn't he? But yeah, you're right. Merlin and Percival are the characters who who, who light the uh, screen up a bit, don't they? As, as interesting characters, that are a bit more. Even Merlin, he's not I say relatable, but he's in a strange way he is. He steps out, doesn't he? As this ancient figure who he's going to adjust things and manipulate things until he loses control and he has this battle with Morgana. But some of it gets lost, doesn't it? Because I think the scale of the film tries to cover everything, doesn't it? And I think it would have been probably more focused if they would have kept with that original concept of concentrating on their story. Well, a a lot of it gets lost by all the shouting. It's a very shouty film, isn't it? It does. It's, those knights, they just shout. They can't. They can't. They, they can't. They're like men who can't can't speak quietly. Everything's shouting. I think it calms down later in the film, doesn't it? But initially, it, it's men running around shouting at each other all the time, and no for no apparent reason. Sometimes I think, particularly in the early part of it, it's a way of representing the chaos, isn't it, of the yeah, land yeah. pre. Arthur united it, and you're right. Everybody's like riding around, covered in mud and grime, and bawling at each other, aren't they? Bawling at each other, all in a very angry way. Even if they're on the same side, they seem to disagree. Which I suppose, like you say, that maybe that represents that anarchy, the Uther Pendragon anarchy thing of, of yeah, before Arthur unites people. But on another level, it's quite funny (laughs) because you do you do watch it and think, just can't right, just calm down. What did you say? <laughs> Stop shouting. Stop shouting at everybody. I love those uh, early scenes the, when they're in the grime and in the uh, armour, yeah. battered and worn. And there's really yeah. three stages of the story, isn't there? There is that anarchy stage. Then Arthur forms the round table and you get Camelot and they're all in gleaming armour. It symbolises that they're in Camelot and paradise kind of thing. Yeah, Everyone's polished their armour. In the final act, and uh, the third act where everything goes a bit Zardoz. <laughs> it's the search for the Holy Grail. So it kind of descends into uh, dream fantasy. This bit, bit annoying, that bit. I mean, some of the Holy Grail stuff is good, like when Percival's looking for it, like the tree and the, the crow picking out the eye and all that. But at the same time, it, it is a bit like a dream sequence. And the way he kind of mind drifts off 
I think it comes back to what we were saying. The films is its strongest when it's concentrating on the humanity of Percival and yeah. the uniqueness of Merlin. It becomes less strong when it's more about the symbolism and what they yeah. represent. Funny because I thought that Starburst was uniformly supportive of it and the magazine... I remember it's one of the first ones I got where it covered it. They had two contrasting reviews. The staff reviewer, John Brosnan, who I used to love, I used to read his articles at the end, it's only a movie, and he he pans it. And part of his criticism is exactly that. Who wants to spend two and a half hours looking at symbols moving around? (laughs) Well, I want to talk about uh, one part of it that I'm going to read a little bit of his review and we can uh, comment on this before we, we go further. He suggests that because the accents and voices are all over the place, everybody should have uh, done it in a French accent. Doing it in French should have also solved the problem of Nicole Williamson's funny voice. I still can't figure out what he was up to. Why, at some time during the shooting, didn't Boardman take Williamson aside and quietly say, Hey, Nick, old lad, what's with the funny voice? Or was it Boardman's own idea to have him speak in that strange way, putting the emphasis in all the wrong words in practically every line? Uh, Williamson occasionally sounded like he was doing a bad imitation of Fagin in the musical Oliver. Answers on a silver grail, please. (laughs) I think when we watched it as kids, we used to do after we'd watched the film, we used to do silly impressions of Merlin. Yeah. We, used to, we used to say things in a Merlin voice, didn't we? We used to do it to annoy and amuse each other. <laughs> you still do, don't you? I still <laughs> I can't really do it now, but when we were kids, we, we used to do that after the first we used to do funny voice. But the, the greatest, the, to be fair, I think re-watching it, he gets away with it because the interesting thing about Merlin, and this this always stuck with me as a kid watching it when we watched it. There's a point where Uther, right at the beginning of the film, Uther says to Merlin when he when he, he's attracted to uh, what is ultimately Arthur's mother. John Borman's daughter. John Borman's daughter. Weird. And anyway, we'll move on. Move on. Mm. He, he says, you're not, you don't understand because you're not a man. He implies that he's like a supernatural being rather than a, with just a man who's a wizard. So I think he gets away with that odd way of speaking. It makes him odd. It makes him seem odd and out of kilter with the rest of the film. But then he is odd and out of kilter with the rest of the film because he's he's a, what is he? Well, I don't, it doesn't really, you're not really told what he is. But is he a spirit? Is he some kind of, well, we don't know. But the biggest, yeah. the biggest accent criminal has to be Arthur. Yeah, Nigel Terry. Because he, start, he yeah. starts, starts off as an Irish. Oh, I think it's Irish. And then he, then he sort of becomes what seems like Cornish or Devon. And then it just disappears completely. In the uh, poster magazine, uh, they make a big deal of that final scene with uh, Mordred and mm-hmm. Arthur encountering each other for the first time mm-hmm. and uh, Mordred impaling him with a lance. And as he falls, Arthur plunges Excalibur into his chest. Uh, fantastic scene in the... They make a meal of it, don't they? But it it, it is great how that's uh, how that stage. And of course, now not at the time we watched it, but now when you see Mordred, you do want to say Gisborne. The design of Mordred's uh, armor is particularly good. It reminds me of um, one of the manifestations of Ariok in uh, Moorcock, particularly when Charlie Bowman's uh, wearing it early on. See, so mm. kept it in the family, didn't he, uh, John Bowman? Yeah, got it. Charlie Bowman. Not a very good child actor. But there is something about um, Paddy's performance as well that he brought to Gisborne that he, he, he didn't have to do a lot for you to be irritated by him. No, he, he, had, a natural, he had a natural gift playing villains, I think. There's something about him, isn't there? And the other anticipation, I mean, you've already mentioned it, the scene with the crow plucking out the eyeball <clears throat> of uh, the knight dangling from the uh, tree. And uh, that that is the bit that we were looking forward to at the time when we queued up to go and watch this in Bolton. But there was oh, a problem. Yeah. There was a problem, wasn't there, Blythe? There was a bit of a problem, yeah. Uh, another a classic Dirk and Blythe miscalculation because it was a double A certificate film. That 
that was later replaced by the 15 certificate in the UK. But at the time, uh, in the early 80s, late 70s, you had this double A certificate. And the double A certificate said you could you could watch it if you were 14 or older. So it was an odd certification, really. But 14 or more, you could watch a double A in a cinema, right? And we were 13 at the time, weren't we? We were, yeah. But we thought, but we thought, we thought, rightly, we'll, get we'll look 14. There's no, there'll be no problem, will there? Be no, there'll be no problem. I don't think we, I think we managed to do that thing where she did ask us what our age was and when we were born and we kind of looked at each other, uh, and we, uh, uh, 67, yeah, it, it, it was like looking at each other, so reass- trying to reassure each other that we calculated yeah, yeah. it correctly. And yeah. We managed to convince and I don't, her. I don't think she cared. I don't think the box office woman cared in the slightest, did she? she it was just some formality. Wait, wait, how old are you? You're 14, yeah, okay. They don't care whether you are or not, really. Um, that wasn't the issue. The, the issue was the, we, we thought because we're 14, the, the price would be, well, we weren't 14, but because we were purporting to be 14, it would be a children's price, wouldn't it? You'd think yeah. so. So wouldn't you You'd think? Well, they only play in the adult price at sixteen, but of course, they got that's the problem. We said, "Oh no, no, but we're fourteen. Well, we're not fourteen, but we're fourteen. It's children's price. Oh no, for a double A, it's it's adult price, even though you're not an adult. Well, we didn't have enough money. Well, that, we didn't have enough money. And there was a woman behind us, wasn't there, queuing for another film with two children, and she she gave us the rest of the money, didn't she? Yeah, to she pay. Who was that? Who was that woman? We never we never knew, did we? We don't know. I, but, she and felt we, a bit sorry for us. <laughs> oh, did she? Did she? Um, I think, was it an extraordinary act of benevolence or did she want to get her kids quickly into the showing of Flipper, <laughs> the yeah, Wonder Dolphin it. or something? That's that's the perspective of an adult. As, as children, as younger boys, we thought, what a lovely woman, what a saintly woman. She's given us that extra 50p or whatever it was to get into this film. But now, as adults, you've had you've got children and had young children. We now think, no, no, it wasn't that. What she was thinking was, for crying out loud, I've got two kids here. They're moaning because we're going to miss the start of this stupid film, Flipper, whatever. I've got to <laughs> sit through for the next two hours. These two idiots haven't even got the right money. I tell you what, I'll pay. Right, yeah, get in, go on, clear off. That's that's what I'd be going through in my mind. Yeah. But at the time, we thought she was like some kind of. Angel from above who said, Don't worry, a guardian angel, I will pay, I will give you the 50p that you need to get in, boys. <laughs> it had a, 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 a big effect on us seeing that film mm. because it's probably the first adult orientated film. Was it an adult orientated film? We can perhaps uh, discuss that, but it, it did strike us, didn't it? Because, you know, in the uh, early section of the film, there's I suppose like a brutal scene with Uther seducing Arthur's mother. It's done that way to contrast Uther against uh, the tenderness uh, later yeah. that we see with Guinevere with Arthur. Remember, this is the man who created Zardos, so the subtlety is... <laughs> Zardos so, is never far away. <laughs> but it, it did have a, a really uh, striking impact on our uh, on our young imagination, didn't it? At that point, yeah. And I think yeah. seeing it, the big scene. Remember, we didn't. I didn't watch it again till sometime later when I got it on VHS. So mm. all the images were just from that one showing that impressed itself on in my head, yeah. along with these companion bits from uh, Starburst magazine. I've not, I've not seen it since we watched it again. I think I've seen clip bits of it on the TV, but I've never sat down and watched the whole thing. And I was a bit worried that it would be rubbish. I thought, oh no, is it going to be rubbish? This and I, I've as a as a kid, it's made an impression. But now, thirty odd, forty odd years later, I, I'm just going to think this is rubbish. But it, but it's not actually. It is. There are bit, there are bits and pieces that you can argue are a bit funny, and some of the acting's a bit theatrical actually it doesn't work there's there's one bit i think just after arthur's pulled the stone out the, the sword out of the stone and he goes off with merlin and there's lots of close-up of nigel terry's face looking startled and surprised and it, it's just over the top 
it's kind of yeah. funny. It's like hammy, but it but it's theatrical acting. It's acting for a stage, isn't it? Where the audience yeah. is some distance away, not not a camera in your face. So there are bits like that in it. But that said, I did think it holds up quite well. Yeah, yeah. and I think it is a set piece. I think it's perceived. Clearly, this spent a lot of time in Borman's imagination, and it's perceived as a series of set pieces. And the imagery is really strong, you know, the way that they staged and the way that they dressed um, is fantastic. And you know, you're right; I think some of the acting could have been toned down. The uh, um, both Shakespeare Company actors and you know may, may, maybe John Bronson was right. They should have been taken aside and said, hey, "Are you going to shout like that all the way through it?" But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe they were because they do stop shouting later on. Maybe they yeah. were. <laughs> He's had a rethink. Just a cast cast meeting. Can we can we stop shouting? <laughs> stop shouting. You're not all in with a fifth at Agincourt. Stop shouting. I, I think that's true. What what you said. It, the, interesting that article from Starburst, isn't it? That this has been in John Bowman's mind for a long time. Because that probably comes across in that he did care about it. He cared yes. about it. Uh, and sometimes with fantasy and sci-fi films of the of the 80s and even late 70s, you sometimes get the feeling that the people behind them didn't really care. They all thought it was a bit rubbish and it was just churned out garbage, really, for a, an audience who liked to see this kind of stuff. But in Excalibur, I think maybe the reason it's a cut above everything else around that time because uh, i'd say it's it, it's probably the best fantasy film of of the era but I'm, you know really far far better than far better than conan far better far better than anything at the time really and that's why it made an impression on us i think you know and i'd, I'd stand by that I'd, i think it's hard to, but that's because i think bowman did he clearly cared about it this this is something he's been planning for a long long time and now is his chance to make it. He's not. He's not going to let it slip by, and he's not going to cock it up. So I don't think when we first watched this, we were actually gaming, but it certainly imposed itself on our gaming. And what I'd like us to do now is to think of how we would use elements of Excalibur now to uh, mm. within our gaming. What are the things that? Um, we could take from the film that we could uh, use in gaming. And I think three each is how this Starburst Memories. We've only done it once before, so <laughs> can't even remember what the format was, but I think we picked three no, things. Well, never mind. Three yeah. always works. The rule is three. Rule is three, yeah. So, but, go on, you go up first. Um, I'm going to say the the, <laughs> the one thing that impressed Perhaps not the first time. Well, maybe the first time, but certainly this this, this time I watched it is armor, armor. You know, it's set in the Dark Ages, so clearly it's historically inaccurate because you did not have full suits of plate mail in the Dark Ages. That was a much later thing. So we're out. Right. But that doesn't matter because it's a fantasy. That's all right. But in terms of gaming, you watch. Everyone's wearing a full suit of plate mail, and the the two things that. <laughs> kind of come across is one is it'd be very hard to hit, actually hurt someone encased in metal very very hard when when they're hit you know yeah you're going to feel the, the strike of a mace or something but it, it's remarkably good protection and and sometimes in gaming plate mail gives you a bit more protection than leather but not that much more and watching the film i'm thinking Actually, give you a hell of a lot more protection, wouldn't it? I mean, it makes you almost invulnerable, doesn't it? Really, and, and I suppose in medieval times you had special weapons designed to tackle armor, because if you're coming at them with a with a sword or something, or you might not, you 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 know how pushed, aren't you, to hurt someone? So in terms of gaming, you think eh, you have to reevaluate play it in in gaming. But the flip side to that, the flip side is. The other thing that you notice is everyone's running around in plate mail. Yeah, I, I, running around in it. I, I around think in it. I think that uh, John Borman was a kind of GM that hand waved the encumbrance rules. Exactly, and and that the, uh, it made me look at it and think it may be in gaming that kind of armor should offer you really really good protection, better than a lot of games actually give it credit for. But 
it should be so inconvenient that as an adventurer, you, you can't really get away with it. You know, we've all done it, haven't we? We've all played the D&D game where the paladin's in full play, clunking around. There's no way you could do it. There's, there's a scene where they come to a castle, isn't they? Gallop, like, like they do, because they gallop around the countryside like football hooligans at the beginning, don't they? All shouting at each other and hitting everyone. They, hitting everyone. And get, how do you know whose side you're on? They're all wearing, how do you know whose side? You don't even know who's on your side, do you? They, get, they charge into battle and everyone just starts hitting each other. And you think, oh, what's going on here? I know it's the anarchy, but it's chaos, but there you go. And there's, there's knights in full play climbing up siege ladders. What are you thinking? No way. From my, my, my games master brain's thinking, no way, no way. <laughs> all, those, all those people in the castle need to do is stand there in a bit of light armour, studded leather at the battle on the ramparts and go, Look at these idiots. He's trying to climb a ladder in full plate. What should we do? Nothing. He's going to fall off and die. Yeah. He's going to fall in the moat and drown. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I think there is only one moment, isn't there, where uh, during a joust, uh, Arthur is dismounted and uh, during the uh, battle with um, Lancelot, in fact, um, and the squire has to come to his assistance to uh, get him up and get him. Uh, yeah. Get his, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but it did make watching it. I, I was kind of struck by, yeah, this, this armor is really going to protect you, but it's incredibly inconvenient. It must be heavy. It's going to be great, in, great for charging into battle. But if you tried to do it in a game as a games master. Well, you should perhaps give them lots of protection from armour. There'd be such restrictive penalties on clambering around in armour all the time. The other thing that struck me about the armour is how it characterised the different personalities. Mm. Uh, Really used that, didn't they? To um, so Uther looked like a a boar, didn't he? He Looked uh, like you know this terrible uh, entity. Um, and you know, there's, there's something in that, isn't it? Because I think last time we talked about uh, Pendragon and how you're all playing knights, but even within Pendragon, there is this capability by using the traits to have individual personalities and to impose those imper- uh, those personalities upon your attire as well, and how um, you present yourself and your heraldry um, is really important, isn't it? In uh, in that kind of setting. First thing is the physical representation of magic. I like how in this film there is a certain ambiguity to the way that magic is presented. There are some illusions. There are some offensive magics used. However, uh, it's all uh, presented in a way that could be interpreted as using the environment to your advantage. Uh, and the way, you know, so for example, uh, Uther rides on the breath of the dragon, which is this fog that uh, appears and he seems to float ethereally on this, this smog that is created. However, it could just be that he's, uh, he's just wading through the, the smog. It's un- uncertain. And I just think that the way that it's physically represented uh, in the film is uh, really good. And, there is this moment, isn't there, where they descend, he takes a Morgana into these caves. I don't I recognise them, but they made, they made me think of Superman 2. They made me think of... I wondered if it was the set from Superman 2, where he, you know, the, the Superman's yeah. home, where he goes to the ice cave. So I thought, is this, is this Superman 2 revamp? But what... Um... What, what they do that, because there's a lot of, as we've mentioned, dreams and um, symbolism. Merlin takes her into this cave and uh, shows her versions of the future and uh, show uh, Lancelot and um, Guinevere in an in a intimate position, but also to say that the, the, the omnipotence of this uh, dragon and taming the dragon and, and that kind of thing. I think that's a really useful way of taking magic users or to make it a, a physical thing, a physical act that you do so you can actually see it. So is it an apprentice being taken into a cave uh, to see magic at work? I suppose what it does, it, it tries to address the idea of magic as a skill 
and a thing in itself and a, an entity to be controlled. It doesn't just do what a lot of a lot of things do. Where magic's just magic, and some people can do it and some people can't. So it's just magic. It's not like Harry Potter. Oh, you're a wizard, Harry. There you go. You can do magic. There you go. Do some magic. It doesn't really do that, does it? It talks about it in terms of it's something that you need to be tackled and dealt with because it's a force in itself and you're outside that, but you're trying to manipulate it in some way. And I know what you mean. There's a, there's a physicality to the magic. It's not just a thing you can do, you know, and it's, it's talked about in those terms. There's a lot of wizards in films and books. That's not done, is it? It's just they're a wizard. They've, even role-playing games, they're a wizard. You've learned magic. You've learned about magic, and you could do magic. There you go. Yeah. But it doesn't doesn't do it like that. It does it. It's slightly more complicated than that. Yeah. So on the one hand, it, it presents it in a very ambiguous way where it could be explained away by sceptics or whatever. Um, and then in other ways, it shows you and the characters actually confronting magic and mm. actually dealing with it and uh, addressing it. So I, I do and think it, that's... That, that's and it a, also, what's interesting as well is, I suppose, it also, t- Merlin talks about it, it dying as well, doesn't it? As if, like, it's a time for men and all this stuff that he does is is disappearing. It Almost like it's a transient thing. So this magic isn't something that's going to be here forever. It's here at the moment but it's on the wane and there'll come a point where it, it won't exist anymore. Like it's become extinct almost, you know? Yes. Like yeah. the dragon's a dinosaur and it's going to just become extinct at some point and nobody, nobody be able to do it because it's just it's not there anymore. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not an innate ability and it's not an innate ability where it's passed on from one generation to another where people would go, oh, yeah, my dad was a wizard and now I'm a wizard and I can do it. It's not like that. It's something, a force that needs to be controlled, but that force will die. And when it dies, there's no more wizards or witches. Yeah. Yes. It's gone. Yeah. 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 No, that, that that's a, a good way of putting it. Actually, there isn't a succession, unlike the hierarchies mm. of men and, you know, the society that's represented in Arthur's world, this is very yes. much yeah. That's it's, true. Yeah, that's about succession, isn't it? That's about the rightful heir to sort of certain powers. Do you, yeah, in magic, it's not about or inheritance. It's about controlling something, and that if that thing's not there, then it's not there anymore. Maybe we've um, hit upon a climate change theme that we haven't really. Magical climate, magical climate change. Yeah. <laughs> And what's your next one? Well, my next one, talking of Morgan, Morgana. Morgana or Morgan Le Fay? Yeah. Um, I, think, I think in the film they refer to her as Morgana, but she's Morgan Le Fay, isn't she? Morgan Le Fay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that side of the story is interesting. Clearly, women are portrayed as downfall of men, aren't they? So the, the villain, the villain is a woman. But even Guinevere is sort of with the Lancelot thing is it's kind of questionable isn't it that oh here we go uh, there is I mean I'll come on to a point in a minute but there is that sense actually in the film that as I said earlier it's a bunch of very blokey football hooligans running around Britain sorting things out and the men sort it out and they get to Camelot with a shiny armour and everything's fine isn't it but then on come the women and ruin it that's there is that in it, and that, that's not necessarily in the film. I think that's the Arthurian myth, and that there's a wider discussion there, isn't it? But that was interesting that you know, <laughs> for main villains, a woman. Um, but what's interesting, and this is where it comes into gaming, what I really like about it is that when Uther seduces Arthur's what becomes Arthur's mum, and seduces, rapes, you know, questionable, isn't it? Because, of course, he uses magic to disguise his appearance, doesn't he? Morgana is a child. She witnesses it, doesn't she? She sees it. She's then forgotten about it for about an hour. But she's yeah. going to come back, isn't she? Yeah. She's going to come back and wreak havoc. And, and she's vengeful because of what happened to her mother. And I, to be honest, I'm kind of on her side. I think she's all right. She's got a point. Maybe, I, maybe I'm on her side because it's a young Helen Mirren. In terms of gaming, what I, when I watched that, what's great is like you forget this in gaming. It's an obvious thing to do, but you do sometimes forget it when you're running a game. It's the law of unintended consequences for players. So when players do something, who witnesses it? And who does it affect? So the number of times where 
the players will go in somewhere and kill all the guards and do this, do that with gay abandon. The idea that oh, the guards have families. What about the guard's son who five years later comes looking for you? And that's sometimes a really good thing to do in a role playing game, isn't it? As a sneaky GM to go, oh, okay, we killed all the prisoners of you. All right, make a note of that. Yeah. <laughs> and then later on, you think you've got away with it, but you haven't got away with it because someone's coming back for you. And of course, that's what happens in this this little kid who, again, I mean, obviously, we've seen the film before. So we you watch it and know it's Morgana. But maybe the first time you watch it, you don't realise that it's her. You know, this this child that's that's watching him and sees him. And he kind of looks her in the eye, catches her eye, doesn't it, as he, as he leaves. It's a nice setup. And it does translate into role-playing, those little unintended consequences of the, the slightly too, shall we say, incautious player. Oh, we can kill the guards. Oh, we can torch people. Oh, we can do this. We can do that. Mm, okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what happens in King Arthur. You know, Uther, yeah, use some magic, get what you want, get away with it. Yeah, but, you know, 20 years later. Because right, that's, a, I like that idea of, uh, you know, who witnessed the actions of the player characters and mm. what impact does it have on them and who can they corral? You often think of reoccurring enemies, but sometimes it can be on the sidelines and uh, emerges enemies. Exactly, yeah. Slighted. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and we think we've both, when we've run games, we've both done that, but sometimes it's interesting to be reminded of it. And this, this film does remind you of that. You watch it and think, oh, yeah, you can do that, can't you? Little girl comes back as powerful evil witch. <laughs> One of uh, my next uh, one, and uh, I took, I did take a note of this because it's just about the stage management of the fights. There are some really great fight scenes in Excalibur, and as you've mentioned, the in the armor, and the armor looks uh, great on them, uh, particularly in the earlier sections of the yeah. the film. Fighting in water, so when you're <laughs> stage managing a fight. <laughs> How often do you do it when they're waist high in water? Because that gives you... In full plate mail as well. <laughs> Coming back to my point, in full armour, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to water or rivers, they're usually uh, flowing rivers and some of you've got to get across it and you find yourself having a battle with a thing whilst you're on board a boat. But with this one, they kind of stride through water, don't they? The water's everywhere, the stream's everywhere. And mm. it provides them some cover because of the rocks. Um, but they also stumble in over the, the rocks. And the, uh, the water is just uh, as, a, as a role in the scene. In, well, there's a, uh, great, there's a great shot, isn't there, of them riding horses through the water. Yeah. Right? They're riding along the river or the moat. They ride along it, don't they, rather than through it. As if it's, it's not really an obstacle, but it's they're on horseback, so they ride along the river. And it, it's up to the sort of horses sort of waist kind of thing but yeah, yeah it's kind of a good shot because like you're saying in role-playing games rivers are always you can either get across it no problem or um it's fast flowing and you're going to drown but there's more subtle ways of dealing with it water isn't there yeah, yeah. a fighting a fighting waist high water could still be a problem for players yeah so if, if you struck down and prone you have the di mm. difficulty of, of you've got to get your head above water. Um, I'm just thinking of that scene with uh, Lancelot and yeah. Arthur. I suppose it, it recalls the uh, confrontation with Little John and uh, Robin Hood, yes. which is also done in water. But you just never think of it, do you? So staging a fight in, a, in water when you when you're waist high in water. Yeah. No, you don't. You always yeah. You tend to think. It's either water you can't, you're going to have to pass and risk drowning. The water in that film isn't a threat. The, the threat is a fighting water because you yes. end up in the water fighting it, like you say, at waist height. But that brings with it all sorts of problems in terms of mobility and the armour and all sorts of things. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that, that's my second thing. What's your uh, last thing? What have you got up last? Uh, my last thing is magical, magical weapons or magical items. 
Um, because obviously the magical item in this is Excalibur, isn't it? You've got the Holy Grail, of course, but that's uh, less interesting because it's dream sequence nonsense. But you've got Excalibur, um, the magic sword. Um, watching the film, it, it, it makes you think about how magical weapons and magical items in some games do you become a bit utilitarian you know i mean dnd is the biggest culprit isn't it with this plus one sword plus two sword plus three sword you know everyone's got one everyone's got a magic oh i've got a plus one dagger here and a plus three mace and a plus two bow and it all becomes a bit run of the mill to, to the point where you feel a bit cheated if by fifth level you've not got a magical weapon so what's going on why haven't i got a magical weapon yeah, and yet when you watch Excalibur, the, the only magical weapon in it is Excalibur. That's it, possibly in the world. But that yeah. but that enhances the sense of magic about it, doesn't it? I suppose it's a bit like your point about that, the way it deals with the physicality of magic. That sense of there's, there's only, this is the only magical sword in the, in the world, and that's it. It makes you think about how maybe the use of magic in role-playing games you know sometimes are we a bit too free with it all here's a magic item here's another magic item and i mean i know D &D, I'm, I'm picking on dnd &D, but other other games do it as well i mean i suppose like runequest isn't it there's lots of magic in it the spirit bound spirits in weapons and power storage crystals and all this kind of stuff and the, the problem with it is it, it's difficult then to make magical items seem magical because they just seem yeah. ordinary don't they you know, in RuneQuest, everyone's got... I suppose a power storage crystal in RuneQuest was always the same as a plus one sword in D&D. If you hadn't got a power storage crystal by about four or five games in, you'd think the games master would be mean. Yeah. Because everyone else has got one. Why can't I have one? But it but it makes it makes magic become... I suppose it makes it become mundane, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. And we have... Whereas played, in Excalibur, we? Excalibur's yeah. not, not mundane. We have played, haven't we, in scenarios and campaigns i'm thinking of han uh, in particular where it's a low magic environment um, and does it does it make it more special i don't know whether uh you really need to go into that mythic britain type setting to really get the most out of that i think scarcity in any kind of powerful items um does give a different complexion to your games doesn't it you get that difficulty where you drop in sometimes into a game some magic item that is powerful I, I suppose what i'm driving at is it'd be very difficult i think to have an excalibur moment so when he pulls the sword from the stone that's a great moment isn't it in the film it's a class i mean it's a great moment in mythology it's a, one of those things isn't it the sword and stone is and the lady of the lake hand in uther uh, the because uh, it is Uther, isn't it? it gets handed it from the lake. Yeah. I mean, Arthur gets it when he breaks it, gets another one. But that hand coming out of the lake with the sword, these are really great atmospheric moments in the film. But in a in a game setting where magic items are commonplace, that's difficult to recreate, isn't it? Even mm. even if you say, and this this is the kind of thing that goes on in role playing games all the time. Everyone's got magic items. Everyone's got magic. It's all fine. And then as a games master, you go, ah, yes, but this, this sword, this sword is really, really magical. It's more magical than the magical swords you've got. It's like a kind of <laughs> a kind of escalation of magic in a game. But it, but it never, I'm not sure it ever works. I'm not sure it ever works in, a, in for example, I mean, again, not pick on D&D because it's the most obvious example, but in a game of D&D where everyone stood at the lakeside with, you know, a plus two dagger, this, that, or the other, healing potions, all sorts of things, magical sword being passed to them. There's a bit of like, oh, I'm all right, yeah, so it's a bit more magical than this sword I've got, but it's just, you know, seems a bit flat, I think. Whereas in, yeah. in a game where there's very little magic, the beauty of those games is that magic item becomes more significant. significant. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can create more, as a games master, you can create a scent, bit more atmosphere and more of a sense of wonder about it than in games where there's there's lots and lots of magic. So watching Excalibur did did make me look at it and think, yeah, you know, sometimes maybe that's the, the way to go with games. My uh, last one is the power of love. The power of love. 
It a song is. by Jennifer Roche. All right. Frankie Goes to Hollywood, take your pick. I don't mind the Frankie Goes to Hollywood one, but the Jennifer Rush one is on the list of terrible, terrible songs that must be switched off on the radio <laughs> at all times because it's absolutely awful. I am pretty coy about using romance or any any sense of uh, relationship as a driver for action and plot uh, within games. Whereas in drama, in literature and in myth, it is a key area, isn't it? It is what drives people to take action or, you know, it is, it, and particularly in this story, it's Lancelot's love of Guinevere, it's Arthur's love of Guinevere that is at the centre of it, isn't it, that when I was watching it, because obviously I've been playing Pendragon and we've been talking about Pendragon, you can really see how that trait of chase and lustful uh, is played out in uh, this. It also made me think of how other games, such as Powered by the Apocalypse games, newer games, really do draw heavily on that as a key motivator for characters, which us from that kind of traditional background, it was never really a point of our games. That, you know, it, it doesn't really feature. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, don't you mean? I, yeah, I suppose players are more likely to buy into love of family, aren't they? Brother or sister under threat. Players tend to buy into that because it's an obvious thing. But I know what you mean. Trying to make a player fall in love with an NPC to the point where they would risk their life for the NPC. I suppose it does require player buying, doesn't it? Or some mechanic in the game. That's I mean, I know what you mean. Yeah. Pendragon has Pendragon has he has some of those things, but maybe you need a mechanic where there's some terrible consequence for the player character if they don't deal with the love interest. Something or, mechanically bad, mechanically bad happens to the character. Or you do it the other way, where there's something mechanically supportive if they do. Um, so, yes. yeah, yeah, uh, which yeah. is what is what powered by the apocalypse games do, isn't it? Give you uh, moves in order to do that kind of yeah. relationship building thing uh, to encourage you to do it. In groups that we've had, and uh, thinking about the people that I play with, well, I think we'd be pretty coy about doing it. But it does make me think that really, are we missing a trick to uh, explore that area within games? Yeah, I think so. I suppose it's always easy. To- I think we have we have played games like that, but the difficulty is with the, the love as a motivating force is how far does a player character go in terms of... So, for, for example, looking for treasure or trying to kill a villain or doing that kind of thing, the players... There's always that point where the player goes, oh, this, is, this is too risky, this is too risky, I'm not doing it. But I suppose when you look at stories about about love, protagonists in those stories will, will do the most outrageously dangerous things. Would you would you sacrifice your character character's life to save the NPC that you're supposed to love? That's the kind of thing you're talking about, isn't it? That requires a degree of a high degree of player buying, doesn't it? Yeah. For the player to go, actually. I know I've played along with the idea of being in love with this NPC, but now it's my character that I've been playing for five years is going to die. Oh, the NPC is going to die instead. <laughs> Hard luck. I know I said I loved you, but now you're going to die. I'm not going to die because I'm a player character. But that just takes quite a bit, doesn't it, as a player to do that, I suppose. Then I suppose it comes back to what are the consequences of that, you know, making that decision of mm, um, yeah. sacrifice. What yeah. what are the repercussions? Some games, like you said, some games probably deal with it far better. So Pendragon probably would deal with it quite well and powered, some powered by the apocalypse stuff, but yeah. other games wouldn't, I suppose. Yeah. It's great, isn't it, that this is one of the foundational films of our imaginations. It's still providing inspiration to our games now. And I'm very tempted by there to get this poster magazine that I've had hidden away, being reunited with it 40 years later. Mm. Tempted to put it up on the wall. In my bedroom, it was put up with pins, actual pins. Not going to put it in your bedroom now, are you? I might do. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Dice going to think of that. I've got to swing this up here in the bedroom. I think she'd be more disturbed by my use of pins to put it up. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can put it up, but not, but you got to use blue tack. Don't, yeah. don't use pins. <laughs> Back in the eighties, we didn't care, did we? We used actual pins. Yeah, we don't. We didn't care. Blue tack can leave a stain on the wall anyway. You, you yeah. know, come on. What's yeah. worse, pinhole or? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Blythe. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Right. Appendix G. Welcome to Appendix G, the part of the podcast that builds up into collectible parts. A member of the Grog Squad nominates a TV programme, film, book, comic or other influential cultural artefacts to create the ultimate list for every grognard. And I've got Sam with me. Sam Vale. Hello, Sam. Hey, Dirk. How you doing? I'm good, thanks. It's uh, good, to, good to hear you. Now, you've going to nominate something that we have covered before in episode 27 however it deserves a special place in appendix g and what are you nominating sam robin of sherwood uh, originally produced in 1984 by uh, htv in association with goldcrest running for three seasons and a total of 26 episodes how, how old were you i was 17 in that first episode i would be uh, 16 just leaving school at that point uh, uh, yeah so maybe viewing this thing through the blush of rose tinted spectacles but uh, it was pretty special at the time it was incredibly influential on uh, us role players i mean it was a it was a must to watch wasn't it because it was basically a, you know tales of a D party Getting into adventures, just moody, atmospheric, sword fights, archery, sorcery, mysticism, all that sort of stuff. And of course, the, the soundtrack with Clanad. I mean, what, what, there's nothing else around that sort of time, like Blake Seven, maybe Doctor Who. But yeah. uh, but no, this is this is different. It, it was, and I think it was helped by a very charismatic actors. Absolutely, the Merry Men, uh, Robin and the Merrys were. Uh, particularly endearing, weren't they? They all had distinct characters. And there were great archetypes for role-playing characters, such as, you know, Michael Prade as Robin of Loxley could have been ideal for Paladin or Ranger material. You know, Ray Winston as Will Scarlet, a hothead hater of Normans, a sort of absolute psycho fighter. Awesome. They all had their own. And, of course, Nazir, who, who didn't want to play a character based on Nazir, wielding his two swords, very much so. I think uh, Eddie had about six consecutive characters that were based on uh, Nazir. Youth um, were influenced by the way that they were constructed, weren't they? And how, how they delivered uh, stories. Yeah, the idea of emulating these stories, the characters and villains, of having persistent antagonists, I think, was the, the main thing that, f- that first opened up my, my thoughts on the GMing. Villains who have their own goals, motivations, you know, that sort of thing. Lots of was a lot more interesting for me. And the players, it's more, more interesting than running into a new monster of the week, for example, or a, or a mega dungeon with stuff to kill and loot behind every door. Robert de Reno, the sheriff of Nottingham, mostly interested in increasing his own power and wealth, whilst uh, Nicholas Grace uh, chews the scenery in every one of his scenes. Uh, Philip Jackson's the Abbot Hugo, slimy side of the church, only interested in acquiring more land. Uh, he was the source of many slimy antagonists for my, for my religious institu- institutions in my games. Sir Guy Gibson, warrior leader, constantly belittled by the sheriff, kept on a leash, much of his frustration. So yeah, another great archetype for a villain. Constantly scheming. Uh, that's, that's what I get to, uh, to think about. Obviously, there are other villains as well who are great. Uh, some Morgan of Ravenscar from the Swords of Wayland. Another great villain posing as a nun, but actually a leader of a coven, trying to bring Lucifer into the world. I mean, this is half past six on a Saturday night. Blimey. There were other great villains as well. Derek O'Connor's Raven, mercenary leader. He was after the treasure of Agravain in The Inheritance. He had his horrible dwarf sidekick as well. Thoroughly vile character. Great villain uh, to copy. So all this massively influenced the way I thought about and designed the adventures we were doing and campaigns for my group. Villains who had long-term plot goals basically took us out of the dungeon setting and made the world come alive yeah i hadn't really uh, considered that before that is something new to the uh, games wouldn't it to have a repeating villain i know that uh, we had uh, in our uh, RuneQuest game that gringle of gringle's pawn shop became um, mm-hmm. a super villain it the players took against him very much a, a bad guy that would keep repeating coming back yeah a lot of my play at the time was basically mega dungeons with monsters behind every door being able to introduce you know long-term characters and, and villains was, was a huge step forward in my 
game design. The source of uh, Wayland is a good example, isn't it? That it's a really well constructed uh, uh, series of situations yeah. and encounters that build up into it's something it, it, did that have an influence on you as well I mean the nature of the show itself containing a, like a whole adventure within the one hour episode or something occasionally two parters certainly influenced my adventure design taught me about pacing beginnings middles and endings you don't need to detail as long as you know where you start what event should occur during the game and where you're going to end up really opened up the whole nature of how a story should run Richard Carpenter uh, was good at uh, pacing out the action as well you could almost feel the beats when the fights were going to occur, didn't you? you need, it, it only went uh, 10 minutes before the next fight came along. Which is, which is great, just like a, just like a D&D adventure. You know, something's going a bit slow, chuck a combat in. Did you make the transition from uh, Parade to uh, Jason Connery? I know that we struggled with that. Yeah, I know. I, I tend to enjoy those, uh, that third series uh, a lot better. A lot more. I mean, the, I mean, the first uh, Hearn's Son was the first episode in series three, uh, which featured like getting the team back together. That Welsh uh, Lord Owen of Clun, just a, an awesome villain, with uh, Gulnar, played by Richard O'Brien, his uh, sorceress uh, advisor. Loads of uh, magic and mysticism sprinkled throughout the whole thing. All of it fairly subtle as well. Nobody casting fireballs or lightning bolts. Bewitching individuals with magic. Is, is a nice change of pace, I think. As you know, this episode is all about Pendragon. Since I've known you, you were running Pendragon, but with your very distinctive take on it. Well, I played Pendragon, Pendragon since the first box set. Uh, it's also one of my comfort games. But uh, yeah, I ran a, a long campaign uh, with my old mate, Paul Coburn, and he, he'd always loved Pendragon. So we played a, a standard Arthurian campaign based on Time of the Wolves, the mini campaign campaign from wordplay games. When that came to an end, we decided we wanted to go something somewhere else with it. We settled on a spy genre, specifically spies from the 60s, when knights became uh, agents of MI5. Merlin was a fey wizard creating gadgets for the team, and uh, Guinevere was a team surgeon and psychiatrist. And, and that was how we started with the Excalibur branch. Converted the rules over. It's quite simple, just added a few extra skills, you know, tradecraft, driving, shooting, and repurposed a few others. Intrigue became information gathering. Just worked as normal pin dragon rules with, with no wintering phase. And we got around the damage and healing thing and having no armor by having the agents given magical shimmer shields, they were called Merlin, that created gadgets. So that campaign is currently three years and going on a weekly basis. Uh, I think it's down to the story, basically, rather than the mechanics. What, what I find interesting about it is that, you know, as we were saying in the previous part, a Pendragon seems extremely focused on uh, Arthurian knights set in a medieval setting. You, you've got, you, you've done it for the um, secret agents, but you've also done it for other settings, something like Mythic Greece as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I thought a Greek Pendragon game would work really well. So, you know, create three classes, a demigod, uh, a hero and a normal common man and just go from there using all the same uh, traits and passions and things like that. Judge Blythe was talking about how fate points would be quite useful, luck points, a luck mechanic. And and I did in fact have fate of the gods points, a luck mechanic allowing you to re-roll any dice that hit the table if you didn't like it. Does that mean that the traits, because um, things like Valor, those are, those are the very distinctively um, chivalric traits. So do they stay the same? You can just repurpose the flavour of them. They have they are the same. Yeah. So we use valour. We use you know all that merciful, modest, prudent, spiritual, temperate, trusting, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> it's just used exactly the same way. When you look at uh, Robin of Sherwood, are you tempted to use the Pendragon mechanics to bring Robin of Sherwood to the table? I think it would work. As long as you sort out the healing aspect, you can probably do anything with the system. I mean, Robin of Sherwood would, would, would be a good fit. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I did a superhero game with it. So, you know, you can basically do anything. You can do anything. Just It's just the story. It's just like a generic universal role-playing system, I think, without that uh, <laughs> moniker. So thank you for adding... Uh, Robin of Sherwood to uh, Appendix G. I think it deserves to be in there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks, Sam. Cheers, mate.
I'll get me caught. Welcome to I'll Get My Caught, the part of the podcast where we drift towards the door about to part, but we have a bit of closing time chatter, some any other business uh, to discuss before we make our way. I've got a bacon butty waiting for me on the other side of the door. <laughs> Easter Monday, isn't it? Easter Monday. Is anything waiting for you? Any pleasures waiting you on the other side of the door? Blythe. Well, I'm hoping the whole family have gone out by the time this is over. That's the pleasure waiting for me, that everyone's gone out doing something and left me on my own. <laughs> okay, and uh, for your closing time chatter, is anything that's uh, piqued your interest? I I had an interesting experience the uh, last week because, as you know, I've um, taken to uh, a friend of mine. Son got into D and D, and he's now got into Cthulhu. He's fifteen, and he's got into Cthulhu. Um, so he's into his role playing, and I've been going around running games. And last week, I ran for the first time Savage Worlds, Deadlands, Savage Worlds, round a table. A kind of strange thing that. I think I've played it around a table once with you running it. And we've run tons of it online. We play Savage Worlds all the time online, don't we? Play it every other week, and we've run lots and lots of things online. So I said to them, I run some Savage Worlds, Deadlands. And I was a bit nervous because there are bits and pieces of Savage Worlds that are a bit unusual, I suppose, handing out the initiative cards and things like raises and wounds and, you know, things like that that they're a bit tricky but what was interesting was they absolutely loved it they absolutely loved it i'd say it's one of the best sessions i've had in in a while um just all the things about savage worlds kind of came to life even more i think i mean we, we like savage worlds we like it online but some of those things that you experience online really came alive around the table so initiative really quick with the cards. Sometimes the playing cards online are a bit of a pain. It's a bit clunky, isn't it? But round a table, really quick, slick way of doing initiative. Somehow, also, generates a sense of drama. I know in theory, it's no different from rolling a dice, right? You roll a dice for initiative, and you think, oh, yeah, you get a low dice score or a high score. But, but somehow, dealing out cards to people for initiative generated a real sense of tension and excitement about what cards you're going to get yeah and as well things like the bennies the bennies soaking wounds being shaken all these different elements and i know it's predominantly combat because a lot of sav- the savage world's rules are about combat but the fights were great and they really really enjoyed it and I really enjoyed it because they enjoyed it. And I thought, wow, this is this is a great game. I've never run it around a table before. It seems ridiculous. That's a, you know, because we've played can, it and run it for years online. But I can see the appeal. And I think because we played a lot of it and you know, it's a few years since we were first encountered that Savage Worlds, you lose sight of the qualities that it's got as a game in terms of that drama and, um, it being able to actually do stuff, I think that is the revelation of it, isn't it? That mm. when you're used to um, systems where it, failure is um, apparent a lot of the time, what you're looking for in Savage Worlds a lot of the time is the level of your success, isn't it? You look, you you can you presuppose that I'm more likely to be successful because the odds are in my favour. This is a game that likes its players, yeah. isn't it? And you know, you know that. And so you're just looking at what level of success, how, how well you're going to do it. And when, when you do fail, there's always options um, for you to uh, move things along. Yeah. And you never feel completely yeah. stopped by things happening. I think that's I think that's right. Like, that's a good way of putting it. It does like its players, doesn't it? So as players, you feel like you've got lots and lots of options, and I think that's what they liked about it. What some of the fights and combats were quite dangerous, and there were points where they thought we're, we're going to die here. I think one player took four wounds in one go, but then managed to do a soak roll and soak four wounds miraculously. And there's a real sense around the table of excitement that. Right, four wounds. So you're basically on. You, you're out for the count, and you, you're bleeding to death now. Unless you spend a benny, make a vigor roll, try and soak the wounds, and with the exploding dice, 
which Savage Worlds has, you know, re-roll if you get the top result on a dice. He managed to survive. He managed to soak all four wounds. And there's a real sense of excitement about it, you know, that, yeah. which we get, we do get online. We've, we've had those moments online, haven't we? So it's not as if it's a completely separate experience. But for some reason, playing it around a table, maybe you're playing it with people who've never played it before. Yes. It, yeah. It can. It can. It confirmed something about the game. You thought this is a this is a hit. This they've not played this before, and by the end of it, they said, "Oh, run, run some more of that. That was great. Run, run some more. Really liked it." And you think right. oh, that's that's a that's a factor as well. Maybe not just the fact it's around a table. The fact it was people who were new to it who really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. I have found it tricky. I think you were playing with two players, weren't you? I found it tricky at conventions sometimes yeah. when there are six players just keeping a grip mm. of all the bits. I think I mentioned before having of that. I think Savage Worlds is a, a game with loads of bits, isn't it, with action cards yeah. and you've got the additional action cards and you've got the condition cards. There's all these things on the table. And if you've got multiple NPCs, I think it's sometimes easier when you've got one uh, <laughs> one big monster. One big monster. I think yeah. to counteract that, I think in the last one I ran, I had King Kong just to make it easier for myself. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when you've got multiple NPCs, keeping track of the status and things like that is yeah, is, is a yeah. bit trickier. I think. I, I know what you mean. I, I, I use things like I've, I've got all the paraphernalia, you know, the chips for Benny's and the status cards were shaken and wounded, and that does help a lot. But it would be a different experience if you were trying to track all that on paper with just a paper and pencil, you know, who's wounded. But having the status cards to put on the table and go, right, you're shaken, there's your card to remind you you're shaken and remind me that you're shaken, and then you can give me that back when you're not shaken or not wounded. And, yeah. and also doing that for the NPCs as well, it does help control it as, as you say you need you kind of it's a very bitty but you need the bits it's it's one of the it's one of the few games i would say you do need the paraphernalia yeah sometimes with with role-playing game we've talked about this before where people bring paraphernalia to the table and you think you don't need it you don't need all this but with savage worlds i think you do need some of the paraphernalia to, keep to support the things. game to support yes. the game doesn't it yeah yeah definitely well, my uh, my closing time bit is about RuneQuest because we're going to start tonight, actually. First RuneQuest campaign that I've written for th- over 35 years. It must be. I can't keep track of when it actually was. I mean, we've played Borderlands. We've played Griffin Mountain. We've played in uh, some one-shots in uh, using RuneQuest uh, Glorantha. However, this is our first campaign uh, we're doing. And I'm up to my neck in character creation. Uh, a couple of the people couldn't turn up for session zero that we had so I said don't worry I'll roll your characters I'm regretting it now Blythe I bet yeah because I've rolled my own because I'm because I'm a good lad I expect some kind of reward at the first session for rolling my own character <laughs> I rolled my own character and you said I hold you responsible for this hey hey Blythe why don't you be a shaman why don't you be the shaman of the part yeah, that sounds cool, doesn't it? I'll be the shaman. Oh God, yeah, it's complicated enough. Let's let's go for the most complicated character. I went to read the shaman rules about spirit dancing and all this. Oh my God, it'd probably be easier to actually understand a real. Going back to to Merlin, it'd be easier to actually control the dragon and do real magic than it is to get your head around all these rules about shamans in Rune Quest. Well, I, I think I'm going to have you in a, a sweat tent uh, during the <laughs> session to do the full experience. But I, I guess, I mean, we've, we've made this comment about uh, RuneQuest Galantha's character creation, and before that, it it is incredibly detailed. It takes you through um, your grandparents life your parents life and uh, your life to give you build up this backstory and also reveal something about the world in which you inhabit and then you're yeah. building up and um it's one of those things where when you do it once it's lonely fun um when you do it uh, twice it's acts of desperation start to uh, uh, sink in um it i think it, it they need to have 
uh, a similar system as they've got for the Conan uh, generation, character generation, because I've <laughs> decided to do for UK Games Expo um, using 2D20 Conan in the world of Cull. And one of the reasons why I thought I'd do that is because they have got the character creation generator that makes yeah. that life path. They have a similar life path system in that system. However, it just makes it easier, doesn't it? Just having it online and making yeah, a series of choices. Yeah. And at the end I, of I it, agree. it produces a character. And it's, it, I think it's, it's lonely fun as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated and fiddly. I mean, you have to you have to set time aside to set time aside to do it in a quiet room. Think right, let's focus on this. It's not like a casual. Let's roll a character. It's it takes a bit of thinking about, it, doesn't it? But I think it's fun as a player because from my experience was I'm rolling my character here. I'm creating my character. It's interesting to see what I'm going to get. You know, I get you get that. You know, my my father was eaten by the crimson bat at the battle of whatever. You think, oh, that's interesting, you know, or this happened or that happened. You know, well, I think one of the things I rolled was I was driven, I was driven insane by lunar spirits at the Battle of Pavis or something like that. And you think, oh, that, oh that's interesting, you know, and that kind of thing. And I've, I've become, I'm joined Dakafal because I think my father's spirit was destroyed by the Crimson Bat. So the idea of ancestor worship seemed to make sense. Think, well, this is, this is good. I like this, you know, it's kind of, but, but that's because it's my character. If you said to me, roll up five five characters pre-gens for a convention game, I think I would, I think I'd be driven insane by that. Never mind the lunar <laughs> spirits. Yeah, that's a difference, isn't it? I enjoyed it because it's my character. But I, I would, if, I, if someone said run this at a convention and go away and generate, I know you can use pre-gens that are published, but if someone said go away and generate, some pre-gens for, for a convention game, I would I would probably hide somewhere and not want to do it because yeah. it's such an involved there, process. And there are options. There are options to do it uh, quicker, but it doesn't feel the same, does it? It doesn't feel the same um, do it, doing it, uh, it that way, you know, doing yeah. it the shorthand way. You feel like you're shortchanging the character if you don't go through that heritage that the character's got so i yeah. do think i do think it needs to be automated in some way so that it, it's similar yeah. to that modifius uh, site and that uh, resource that it just helps you create characters i have a similar quandary with traveler for when we start the pirates of drinax because traveler does that now it has a it has the traditional traveler way of creating characters and it also has a shorthand way of doing it where you just pick a skill package a couple of skill packages and there's part of me thinks it'd be easy to say to everyone just pick a couple of skill packages there you go but then like you say you feel like that's not the traveler experience is it that's not the experience the experience is to roll the survival roles roll this roll for skills roll for that's the way it should be you know but it but it is it is involved isn't it it's a game in itself really I mean, I think people say that about traveler don't they say character creation in traveler is they describe it as a mini game within the game and I think there's a bit of that to RuneQuest Grolantha now, isn't it? You can say it's almost like a mini game within the game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go and play that mini game two times <laughs> more. Two times doesn't more. It don't, don't feel like a mini game, does it? <laughs> I'll try not get to uh, catch up on the character sheet as I'm having my <laughs> bacon butter. <laughs> Cheers, Blyther. Cheers. Bye. There isn't another bit. Thanks to David Larkins for having a chat with us. You should follow his Pendragon Diaries on the KCM website, where he's giving a progress report on the developments of the ultimate edition of Pendragon. Thanks to Sam, too, for adding Robin of Sherwood to Appendix G. You can track the other suggestions at the Grognard Files Discord server. If you'd like an invite, then please drop me a note at thegrognardfiles.com or at the Grognard file on Twitter. Following the first part, listeners have been keen to remind us that knights have personality too, and the beauty of traits in Pendragon is that it can generate aspects of character that is more interesting than some of the more traditional 
RPGs. I really have enjoyed discovering the game and playing it with Gaz from What Would The Smart Party Do podcast. That campaign is coming to a close, but I will definitely return to the game as I've enjoyed it very much. The best way to keep in touch with what's happening at Grognard Files is to get your head around Discord or sign up to the Patreon and get the newsletter to make a small contribution that helps to keep this show on the road. Thank you to all Patreons, past and present, who make all of this possible. The contributions support our side ventures, such as Virtual Grog Meet, which took place online at the beginning of April 22. Our special guest at the book club was Gareth Hanran, who talked to us about his novel The Gutter Prayer and writing for games. This will be released as a podcast extra very soon. Watch out for that in your pod box. We have something a little bit different planned for the next episode. Look out for that. Until next time, stay clear of the dark and lonely water. Adios, amigos. Thank you.